Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Are we talking about weeks or months? COVID cases keep rising, but when will they peak? One expert crunching the numbers, his prediction, and what a local infectious disease doctor believes. Coming up. Plus, it wasn't an easy decision, but one of the largest marches in the country has just been canceled. That's coming up. But first. We now know more than 800 San Antonio City workers called out sick today because of COVID-19. That includes more than 150 police officers, nearly 90 firefighters. The night team's Patty Santos tells us this is the highest number of city employees out because of COVID since the pandemic began. If the number of city employees out sick or in quarantine continues to increase, we are prepared and monitoring to make adjustments to city services. Emergency responders, solid waste, airport and other critical city functions are slowly being impacted by the latest COVID-19 surge. We're at the highest number of employees that are out because of COVID. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. 845 out of more than 12,500 city staff are out with COVID. SAPD reports about 6% of their officers are out. Fire says 5% of their firefighters tested positive and are quarantining. Methodist, Baptist and University Health Hospitals all report a high number of COVID infections among staff. Every time we think that we're going to have a lull, then it picks back up again and, uh, and the team's working like crazy to cover um, our shifts, uh, making ends meet, helping one another, but this team is very uh, resilient, very strong. They are tired. But help is on the way. More than 400 state nurses are expected to help our area, but COVID is impacting their travel. Been a little problem getting them here uh, because of what we see and read about every day, the thousands of flights that have been canceled around the nation, but they're starting to trickle in. And the good thing is this is our fourth big surge and uh, we know a lot of the plays in the blaze book at this point, so uh, I feel confident that we will surge like we've done in the past. Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council says the new CDC quarantine guidelines will also help ease the burden on hospital staff. The CDC recommendations for isolation has definitely helped us. Decreasing from 10 days to 5 days makes a big difference. And today in hospital staff tell us they are keeping a close eye on uh, staffing and moving personnel around to make sure that there's never a disruption in services. Steve, Stephania. All right, Patty, thank you. Now COVID-19 also disrupting schools. We know Northside ISD reported more than 1,500 staff members were absent today. Northeast ISD also saw hundreds of staff members call in sick. We know that 491 teachers did so yesterday and 576 did so today. Now we continue to see a troubling trend when it comes to hospitalizations. We all know that more people are getting sick with COVID and this graph right here shows the number of cases this week. And for reference, on Christmas Day, 202 COVID patients were in the hospital. You can tell that number right here, way up. Tonight, there are 625 patients in the hospital with COVID, 142 are in the ICU, and 52 are on ventilators. Today, Metro Health confirmed another 2,300 new cases of the virus. Another six people were also reported dead today. So when will this surge start to slow? It's a question that one expert has continued to correctly predict during past surges. The night team's John Paul Barajas speaks with the man who uses math and science to make these projections. COVID modeling is a complex math equation that is helping predict when we can finally see a decline in cases. Dr. Juan Gutierrez is the chair of mathematics at UTSA and is predicting a peak in Omicron COVID cases in two to three weeks. But he still has a warning. Until the world is vaccinated, we will be subject to the risk of COVID. This could keep coming back. The next variant, Sigma, could emerge at any point in time. Infectious disease specialist at UT Health, Dr. Ruth Bergren, also stating today that from what they have seen, they too believe we will see a peak soon. That we'll probably see a peak in about mid-January. We expect it to steeply drop off. The math takes everything into account from how infectious a specific variant is to vaccination rates to rules and mandates in specific areas, then puts it into an equation for a computer to calculate. Susceptible population, exposed population, in this case symptomatic and asymptomatic and then recovered. 
It then provides a predicted range of cases and deaths for mid-July of 2021, with the others estimated 50,000 to 200,000 cases and 750 to 3,000 deaths. The actual number of cases was 100,000 and 1.4K, or 1,400 deaths. And as we try to move past the pandemic, Gutierrez has a message for the community. Our future is at stake. So please, get a vaccine. Please use face masks until this passes. And right now, Metro Health officials are calling the COVID cases in our area extremely alarming. And we're still waiting for some of those holiday cases to kick in. We're just... Uh, well, Saturday will mark two weeks since Christmas. Um, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Now, the virus impacting several upcoming events, including one that hundreds of thousands of people march in. The Asian Festival, the Texas Folklife Festival, being proposed, postponed until next year. And tonight, a change coming for the Martin Luther King March here in San Antonio. The MLK Commission Board deciding to cancel the physical march. It was not an easy decision. It's billed as the largest in the nation, was set to take place on January 17th. The pre-march events also canceled. The commission plans to put vaccine clinics in place near Pittman Sullivan Park on that day. All right, let's talk tests right now. You know, it's easy to find out where you can get a free COVID test in San Antonio. Here's what you do. You take your phone and the camera feature, you scan the QR code that you see on the lower left-hand side of your screen right there. The newest test site open today at the Alamo College's office building on Alamo Street near Josephine Street. And we know that another site is going to open tomorrow morning at Palo Alto College on West Villarette. Now, Community Labs says that you can get the results. Once you get the test, you can get those results within 24 hours at those new test sites. By the way, at that new test site there, more than 2,000 people got tested just today. Wow. Thousands. Wow. We also have a QR code if you need help finding a place to get your vaccine or a booster shot. Doctors continue to encourage people to get the shots to better protect themselves. There are treatments for the virus, but Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the stock of monoclonal antibodies, that's one of those treatments, will only go so far right now. There's only about 3,000 allocated to the state of Texas that could be used every week in, in the state, which means we will have a limited supply uh, to be able to do that. Only 3,000 units for the entire state each week. Judge Wolf and Mayor Ron Nuremberg now sending a letter to the United States Department of Health to try and get a supply of remdesivir. The outpatient treatment has been used to avoid hospitalizations and deaths as well. But there is an obstacle in all of this. Remdesivir is now FDA approved. Yeah, and the reason why that it's a wrinkle here is because that approval means the drug is no longer being distributed for free. And so it's limiting access for community infusion infusion centers. And we're going to keep you updated on that request for remdesivir. Yeah, doctors also remind you if you were infected by a previous strain of COVID-19, it is not likely to help you when it comes to the Omicron variant. And if you are vaccinated, doctors say a booster also needed to protect against Omicron. Switching gears right now, a live look over San Antonio tonight. Ooh, yeah. You know, we've had a bit of a roller coaster this week as far as the weather is concerned. Yeah, we had a somewhat of a warm up yesterday, but now, yeah, the cold front is here. Meteorologist Ka Adam Kasky is tracking that for us tonight. This is what you were telling us about. Yeah, the cold front arrived. We briefly made it into the upper 60s around 1 p.m. Then temperatures fell off and we are expecting a light freeze tomorrow morning, making it to about 30 degrees in San Antonio. It's going to vary in some outline areas. I'll break it down more specifically across all of South and Central Texas in just a bit. But notice how after Friday morning, those morning temperatures, those lows warm back up and we're not really anticipating a freeze. There's a wild card next Tuesday, but right now it looks like we'll be above freezing then. So we'll get more specific how cold and where for tonight. Talk about a little dampness for the weekend. The newest drought monitor is out and some rain chances coming up. Thank you, Adam. Several other big stories we're following tonight. The search for Lena Keel is now in day 18. The three year old last seen at a playground at her apartment complex on Fredericksburg Road. A reward of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars still available for information leading to little Lena.
Now, this is being called Philadelphia's single deadliest single day fire in more than a century. And tonight, investigators are saying that a five year old who was playing with a lighter may have started that fire with the Christmas tree. Those flames spread through a row home early yesterday. We know that 12 people died, including several kids. Now, investigators are continuing to they're still in this case. They're trying to find out exactly what caused this fire. They're also trying to figure out how many people actually Actually lived in that building since a lot of people were there visiting. And Betty White's agent updating us on her funeral plans. Funeral services for the celebrity will not be open to the public. The beloved actress died last Friday at the age of 99. White's agent explained she wanted the arrangements handled privately. He suggests fans honor the memory of this animal advocate by donating to one of Betty White's favorite organizations. They include Guide Dogs for the Blind, the Wildlife Learning Center, and the Los Angeles Zoo. It's still head on the night beat and AC can be a lifesaver in the summer months. Now one portable air conditioner under recall after nearly a dozen fires reported. Also after months of losses, not one, but two winners hitting it big in the Powerball jackpot. But, but, but there's a catch. So we're asking, how are these winnings going to be split? And a candlelight vigil held one year since the January 6th riots. President Joe Biden delivering marks from inside the Capitol today. But how is former President Donald Trump responding to those remarks? It's next on the Night Beat. Tonight marks one year since the attack on the Capitol. About 140 officers were hurt in those attacks, and we know that five people died. President Joe Biden pointedly going after former President Donald Trump in his speech today. Trump responding to President Biden with a statement that included false and discredited claims of election fraud. ABC's Faith Abube at the U.S. Capitol with more on how the nation's leaders marked today. From the mountains to A candlelight vigil and prayers for the lives lost. President Biden blasting former President Donald Trump's, quote, web of lies that led to last year's deadly capital attack. He did so without once mentioning Trump by name. Because his bruised ego matters more to him than our democracy or our Constitution. He can't accept he lost. The president also criticizing the violent mob of Trump supporters who stormed the U.S. Capitol a year ago for threatening American democracy. Investigators have already arrested more than 700 of the suspected rioters, but there are hundreds more still out there, including this person captured on video and suspected of placing pipe bombs at the Republican and Democratic National Committee headquarters that day. ABC News has learned then Vice President-elect Kamala Harris was inside the DNC building when those bombs were found outside. What are your thoughts on the fact that few other Republicans showed up? Today? I think it's uh, it's a reflection of where our party is. Uh, right, guys. Thank you. Sit back. Sit back. Um, very concerning. Republican lawmakers notably absent from the remembrances, except Liz Cheney, co-chair of the House Select Committee investigating the insurrection. And a few of the GOP lawmakers who skipped today's remembrances were in Georgia for former Senator Johnny Isaacson's funeral, including Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell, who blasted Democrats for trying to, quote, exploit this anniversary to advance partisan policy goals. In Washington at the U.S. Capitol, Faith Abube, ABC News. Now we move to a recall alert. These portable AC units being pulled from stores because of fire danger. Royal Sovereign says they've had 11 reports of fire or smoke. One of those fires deadly. They're now recalling more than 33,000 portable air conditioners. Owners should unplug the units, contact the manufacturer. By the way, these were sold at several major retailers, including Costco and Home Depot. The Powerball continues to be a big story. Two winners hitting the jackpot last night, one from California, the other guy from Wisconsin. No one hit it big for months. Now the two lucky winners will have to split $632 million. That's the jackpot. Now if they pick the cash option, the winners will split $450 million dollars. I'd be happy to split not that cash with you. Not too shabby. Steve, I don't yeah. know, man. Yeah. Now let's look outside. Not exactly a $632 million view, but you know, it'll do. 
Live view outside right now. <laughs> Live look at 410 right now. Not too many people out on the roads, and you can bet that a lot of people have their fireplaces going. Yes, right they do. Temperatures falling off quickly tonight. They've been falling off uh, rather efficiently since earlier this afternoon. So another freeze tonight, mainly just a light freeze for about four hours for most of us, with the exception in the Hill Country. We'll get to those details in a moment. Temperatures rebound into the weekend. We're back to 70 degrees by Saturday with some dampness as well. We'll talk about that and then a Sunday cold front to move through. So more yo-yo temperatures up and down. Look at this map. This is interesting today. The high temperatures across the state. Just look north to south from Amarillo, 30 degrees, their maximum temperature today to Laredo, 86, along with Brownsville. Actually, Catula made it to 87, so we're talking a 50 plus degree temperature difference from the Panhandle down into Central and especially South Texas. Look at the readings right now. Teens in Amarillo and Guymon, Oklahoma. Guymon at 12, Amarillo 16. Midland now 27, Abilene 23. I put the wind streamlines on here just to give you an indication of where the winds are coming from because they're transporting that colder air southwards. The north wind means it's out of the north and it's moving southward. Already Fredericksburg at the freezing point right now. And even though we're 51 in Catula, you'll be down in the 30s by tomorrow morning. Del Rio 45, but that colder air is still spilling into town. This is what we're expecting on the map in the morning. Junction, Ozona about 17, Uvalde 28, Canyon Lake 27, Kerrville 24, and Fredericksburg about 23. Even Pleasanton, Carrizo Springs around 30, Elmendorf 32. So right around that freezing point and even just a few degrees below it locally. But as cool as 25 in Bernie, Leon Springs, Timberwood Park, and New Braunfels 28. By tomorrow afternoon, you still want the long sleeves or the, or the light jacket. We really don't warm up much, just into the 50s. Most of us in the low to mid 50s. 54 in Castroville and 53 in Converse tomorrow with increasing clouds. But those high temperatures, Back to 70 on Saturday, 74 on Sunday. Then our next cold front hits and we drop back closer to 60 as we get into next week. So another cold front, but not a very aggressive and impactful cold front that's going to hit us Sunday and then affect us early next week. The wind has pumped the brakes. It's been out of the north. It transported in this drier air dew points in the teens to near 20. We'll have two humid days Saturday and then into the first half of Sunday. You'll notice the humidity after that. It's gone for most of next week, but with that humidity will be the return to some dampness. So let's talk about the overall pattern. I love this map because you can just look at it and see the jet stream coming into the Pacific Northwest, digging southward and then curling up the East Coast. No surprise, that's where the main activity is in terms of precipitation, which is by and large snow. We could use some of that moisture. Latest drought monitor shows 80% of Texas in drought right now. And for us, that's especially moving into the hill country and locations southwest of San Antonio. Our dampness is just going to be in the form of fog, drizzle, and a few sprinkles Saturday morning. Tomorrow just becoming cloudy into Saturday morning. Just a few hit or miss little sprinkles, and that's pretty much it. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to add up to much. But tomorrow, a dry day despite increasing clouds. And then we get into the weekend. Damp to start Saturday. Sunday, sunny, becoming windy. And then that little temperature drop off into next week. All right. Thank you, Adam. So in the beginning of the newscast, we talked about how COVID was affecting schools, hospitals, city workers. Why not? Why wouldn't it affect the Spurs? Name the sport, actually, yeah. because yeah. the Spurs are down four new players. They may get lucky and get another player back tomorrow night, but that's a on the wish list. But right now, the Spurs are in COVID crisis, but that's the only one. So are the Cowboys. More on that when we come back. Our San Antonio Spurs will be extremely shorthanded when they continue their seven game road trip tomorrow night in Philadelphia. That's because as many as four new players have been placed in the NBA's health and safety protocols. Those include starters Derek White, Keldon Johnson, Devin Vassell to go along with Thaddeus Young. They are listed out by the Spurs after apparently testing positive for COVID-19. They will join starter Doug McDermott, who remains sidelined in the league's health and safety protocols. And Lonnie Walker, the fourth listed as questionable, he remains in the league's return to competition reconditioning status. 
helped shore up the shorthanded silver and black with the biggest COVID outbreak of the season so far. The Spurs announced the signing of two players to 10-day contracts, guard Tyler Johnson, forward Anthony Lamb. Ironically, both players have been seeing some playing time in their careers with the Philadelphia 76ers. After missing five games in the league's health and safety protocols, DeJounte Murray returned to action last night to lead the Spurs to victory against the Celtics in Boston. The win broke a four-game losing streak, scored the Spurs' first win during the seven-game road trip. Murray led the Spurs with 22 points in his first game back at the 99-97 victory over the Celtics. He was asked after the game, what was it like to sit out five games where the Spurs are just one and four? It was really tough because this, that, this is my life, you know, besides you know, my daughter, my family, and friends and stuff. Uh, you know, this is my life. You know, this is what I do on a daily basis. Uh, so, you know, having the game taken away from me, you know, for the time it was, you just got to live with it and whatever and, you know, realize that they're just trying to keep everybody healthy and safe, uh, you know, so I respected it and, you know, what can I do besides look forward to coming back? We don't win without DeJounte tonight. You know, we, we need him to win basketball games uh, and uh, having him back was a, a big plus for the team, obviously. There was no greater example of what DeJounte provided to the Spurs in the two-point win over Boston and just illustrates how much DeJounte belongs in this year's All-Star game. But when the first fan voting was released today, he's not even mentioned. In fact, here are the top ten in the voting. Starts out with Steph Curry, goes all the way down to Devin Booker in the top five. And you look at the second half, look at that. Anthony Edwards is in there at number ten with 128,000 just over votes and no mention of DeJounte. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich reached another milestone in his career last night, becoming the first coach in NBA history to coach his 2000th game with the same team. He was asked about that prior to tip-off in Boston and what that means. It means I'm old. Been in the same place for a long time. Had really good players, blah, 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 you know. All right. Yeah, just like anything, Pop is not uh, right now factuated by any rewards so far going forward. Spurs will take on the 76 tomorrow, more, minus those players for sure. And guess who has tested positive again for COVID-19? Utah Jazz star Rudy Gobert. Remember his Gobert, who helped shut down the NBA for four months in March of 2020 when he tested positive just before their game against Oklahoma in 2019-2020 season, was suspended. The Dallas Cowboys dealing with another major COVID outbreak. Next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The COVID outbreak continues to hit the Cowboys hard. It was confirmed today by head coach Mike McCarthy that star rookie linebacker Micah Parsons is out for Saturday's game against the Eagles and will not travel to Philadelphia. You can add left tackle Tyron Smith and cornerback Anthony Brown to the list of players now on the COVID-19 reserve list and out for that game as well. There has been some speculation that Parsons might have exposed himself to the virus when he attended the Mavericks game on Monday. Quarterback Dak Prescott was asked if that should be a wake-up call for the team. We saw the numbers go up here in the in the past few weeks. So I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I've told y'all before. We just got to be cautious and uh, protecting yourself, trying to stay stay away from from the big crowds, limiting the people you're around, and um, just doing all the things you can to necessarily control it. Something that we we obviously don't uh, have have, a, have our fingers on and have control of this thing, or even an idea of, of how not to to get it right now. So just do the best you can to prevent yourself. But just last night, two more members of the Cowboys attended the tribute to Dirk Nowitzki at the Mavericks game, including wide receiver C.D. Lamb and Amari Cooper. Besides COVID, the Cowboys also have a number of players listed as questionable for Saturday night's showdown against the Eagles in Philadelphia in their last regular season game before the playoffs begin. Among them, star cornerback Trayvon Diggs, who has not practiced this week at all due to illness, indicating he may not have tested positive for COVID-19 yet. He was trying to set a new single-season record for interceptions for the Cowboys, tied with Everson Walls at 11. Also listed as questionable are safety Donovan Williams. Wilson, who has been out all week long with an illness as well, indicating his test results are not back. And running back Tony Pollard, who has been limited in workouts this week with that nagging foot injury. Former Aggie starting quarterback Zach Calzada has decided to transfer to Auburn. Calzada was, took over for Haynes King when he broke his leg against Colorado, starting 10 games this past season, throwing for over 2,100 yards and 17 touchdowns. That lead the Aggies to beat number one ranked Alabama for their only loss of the regular season. Tigers recently lost Bo Nix, who transferred to Oregon last month, so they needed help. And it looks like a former Aggie is happy to provide it. You'll see a lot of that. Has seen a lot of that. We'll see more of that as we go along in college football. Stays in the SEC. He does. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. And we'll be right back after this. Chilly in the morning tomorrow, right around and slightly below freezing. And then in the afternoon, only in the 50s. This weekend, a little dampness Saturday and a few hit or miss sprinkles and very light showers next Thursday. So this time next week, we could have a more favorable pattern for rain. But right now, just 30 percent.
All right, and we need that. All right, yeah, we thank do. you, Adam. Thanks Adam. for watching the Night Beat, GMSA at 4:30. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you.